People tend to think that we know everything about volcanoes and how they work. But the truth is they're a huge mystery. All of the explosions at the surface are driven by forces down in the guts of the volcano. I want to take that eruption, rewind it back into how it started, to understand forces deep within the belly of the volcano. Each of these rocks is telling us one story of one explosion. And the geochemical clues left inside of these rocks helps us understand what the volcano is capable of and then what it might do in the future. My name is Dr. Kayla Iacovino, and I'm an experimental petrologist and volcanologist at Jacobs and NASA Johnson Space Center. An experimental petrologist rewinds the Earth's processes to understand how the Earth makes rocks. Geologists are storytellers. That's our job, learning how to use the tools that we've developed in order to tell the stories. We try to tell the story of the Earth, the story of the planets. I grew up in Arizona where the geology is fabulous. You can go anywhere in the state and see textbook examples of any kind of geology that you want. I also grew up watching Star Trek with my dad, with my mom. They were big The Next Generation fans. As I got older, I really realized what amazing stories the universe of Star Trek tells. Here's myself and some of my friends at the Star Trek convention in Las Vegas. They have people in character walking around in costume. It was awesome. I'm a huge Star Trek fan. That idea of exploration not only as a frontier, but as exploration of human nature itself was really appealing to me. I've never seen anything so wondrous. When I got into the science program at Arizona State, I realized I wanted to be able to physically explore these new places on our planet that are completely foreign and otherworldly. I've traveled to the southernmost active volcano in the world, uh, Erebus Volcano in Antarctica, a volcano called Mount Pektu, which is on the border between China and North Korea, Central Africa, where um, there's a volcano called Nyiragongo, which hosts the world's largest lava lake. Costa Rica is a wonderful place to study volcanoes, not only because it has a lot of active volcanoes, but because it's one of the only places on Earth where certain parts of the volcanic system are accessible and exposed. Turrialba and Irazu are both these incredible diverse landscapes. In some areas, they're lush farmlands, and in other places, completely desolate and devoid of life, eerie and covered in dead trees and foliage that used to be a thriving rainforest. It shows you the stark power of destruction to wreak devastation and bury entire towns, cover towns in ash. You know, people can lose their lives. I realize that I'm privileged to come into these areas and do something as esoteric as take a rock back to a lab and then measure what chemicals are in it, when these are the people who are living with the outcomes of what the volcano is doing day to day. We're here in Costa Rica to collect rocks that can tell us the story of these volcanoes, what they're doing right now and what they've done in the past. My particular focus is on what we call volatile elements. So everything that you might find in a gas plume coming off the top of a volcano, before it leaves the volcano, it's inside the rocks. And these are things that turn into gas when they reach the surface. Hydrogen, water, CO2, carbon, sulfur, those things get locked into the rocks that are then belched onto the surface by the volcano. What we wanna look for is pieces of the liquid magma that was in existence in the magma chamber. And how can we do that? Luckily, we have these things called melt inclusions. A melt inclusion is a little blob of what was once liquid magma trapped inside of a crystal. So you could think of a melt inclusion like a time capsule or like a message in a bottle or even an insect trapped in amber. It's this thing that was there for a moment that's now 
encapsulated and preserved for us to study later. We need to find a sample that cooled very, very quickly once it erupted. Ash that has loose crystals inside of it, that's the best stuff you want for melt inclusions. We usually try to take samples from different parts of the volcano, so we're getting different pictures of the story. take all that stuff back to the lab and there we can start to really dive into the details. These are some of the rocks we collected in the field in Costa Rica. And that becomes starting material for our experiments. We load it into a very small capsule, and now it's ready to become a miniature magma chamber in our lab. In order to create a magma chamber in the lab, we use big machinery that can simulate the conditions of the deep earth. So I'm talking very, very high pressures and very, very high temperatures. We can understand how the rock changes if we increase our pressure and decrease our temperature. If we can build our roadmap in pressure and temperature space of where we think those rocks came from. That allows us to tell the story of the volcano and of the plumbing system and where a magma chamber is. Science is about plugging smaller puzzle pieces into increasingly large puzzle pieces and how everything fits together. All of the volcanoes in Costa Rica are related to subduction and that's when you have two tectonic plates on the earth and they come into contact and one of them subducts or slides underneath the other one. We want to understand how carbon is moving through our ecosystem. We were able to discover that a tremendous amount of carbon gets stored not just within the volcanoes, but actually within this chunk of crust and within microbial communities that sits right above the subducting plate. This has huge implications for the existence and the proliferation of life on planets. Are there organisms that are living off of the carbon that's coming up in these systems? If we want to say, which planets do we want to target for life? Maybe we should look for a planet that has active subduction. The majority of my career has been in studying the Earth. And now I work for Jacobs and NASA Johnson Space Center, where I'm studying how all of these processes work on other planets. Planetary geology, as it's called, is really pushing the limits of what we know how to do as geologists. When I want to say something about a volcano on Mars or Venus or Mercury or even a planet outside of our solar system, it's not as easy as just going there and picking up a sample. In most cases, we don't have a physical rock. Instead, we might have sent a satellite to another planet and it's taken a picture of the surface and we can look at that picture and try to estimate what we think the chemistry of the surface is. One of the things we want to understand is how elements are distributed throughout the universe and throughout our solar system, and how did they get distributed when our sun was born. So applying all these skills to other planets is fun and challenging because it really makes you push the boundaries of what you think you can do. When I pick up a rock in the field, I get really excited because I know that that rock has a tremendous number of stories to tell. Traveled maybe millions of miles and millions of years to get to where it is today where I'm picking it up. And it's sort of like the geologist in that moment, you become a part of that rock story. You get to unlock this vast history of this rock with the tools that we have available. And I think a lot of that spirit of exploration came from watching television shows like Star Trek. Keeping those things alive in the spirit of my work is what really fuels it for me. I think I could look back at myself as a 10-year-old girl and tell her what I was doing and why I was doing it, and she would approve.